I say there are things better left unsolved. Who knows what waits for us in nature's no man's land? Impossible, unbelievable, fantastic. But I tell you, it could happen. It could happen. It could happen. It could happen. Yes, it could happen. For various authorities believe that buried somewhere under the polar ice cap, in a state of suspended animation, are the awesome creatures, the leviathans that roamed the earth at the dawn of time. And under certain conditions, a nuclear explosion can free one from his icy tomb. Then, guided by instinct, the beast would come back, back to the caverns of the deepest Atlantic where it was spawned. An armored giant wreaking his prehistoric fury on modern man and his puny machines. Cities would be terrorized by the cruel intruder from the past. Populations crazed and panicked with fear by its destructive force. Granite and steel would crumble. Soldiers and their weapons would be powerless before the onslaught of the beast. The beast, the beast, the beast from 20,000 fathoms. Herald Square, 34th Street, Broadway. Every section of the city is guarded. No one knows where the monster will strike next. Another one, Colonel? No. You know what the radioactive isotope is? No, but if it can be loaded, I can fire it. I'll load it. Just remember one thing. This is the only isotope of its kind this side of Oak Ridge, so you can't miss. What's going on, Beavers? It's Donnie Rings here. Uh, today I'm uh, joined, uh, going to be doing a uh, part for the uh, 31 Days of Howling Beasts retrospective. Uh, my film is going to be The Beast from 20,000 Fathoms. So, uh, released in uh, 1953, directed by uh, Eugene Lore. Uh Doesn't really necessarily star anyone you're going to be familiar with. Uh, because the most important aspect of this film is uh, special effects directed by Ray Harryhausen. Um, if you don't know who that is, stay tuned. I'll give you a little bit more about that in a minute. But um, first things first, let's uh, get into the film real quick. Um, basically, a uh, U.S. military experiment in the, uh, Arctic o- the Arctic Circle ends up uh, releasing this huge prehistoric beast trapped in the ice. And... This uh, scientist who's on board the project, uh, he ends up getting, uh, well, he ends up, uh, you know, seeing the creature, but uh, ends up succumbing to the elements and uh, several other circumstances around him, which sort of makes the uh, military deem his um, eyewitness account rather suspicious. So, uh, anyways, uh, he goes back to the, you know, he goes, he goes back to the mainland and he, you know, arrives in the U.S. for treatment and all that. Meanwhile, a series of boat disasters uh, seem to strike the Atlantic coast. Uh, You know, fishing boats get destroyed, a bunch of lighthouses get smashed, uh, you know, really weird stuff happens. Um, We know all along that it's actually been the released beast from the explosion at the beginning of the movie, but since there's no survivors to any of the incidents, uh, nobody really knows what's going on. They're just weird situations and events and stuff like that. Meanwhile, he finally manages to read about one um, incident involving a survivor. So uh, he ends up getting the idea that uh, since he knows what the cre- he knows that there's a creature and he knows that there's something going on out there, if he can get the survivor to corroborate the story, you know maybe you know there's a chance that they can prove it. So he ends up going to this paleontologist that uh, paleontologist at a local museum who believes the story. And see, he confirms what the creature is. He manages to find this drawing of a prehistoric creature that looks like what he saw. And he go, he you know, contacts the survivor and manages to get him to agree to participate. 
sure enough, the survivor uh, IDs the same exact picture that the scientists saw. Uh, and that confirms everything, you know. All the ducks in a row, these two people that had no idea what, you know, they didn't know anything about each other, never met, you know, no com- contact communication whatsoever. They identified two exact pictures of the same beast that created these disasters. So, okay, that's good enough. So they set out to create this, uh, well, they find this uh, diving bell, and they decide to dr- go into the uh Burrows off the off New York City, and basically they end up spotting the creature, but it ends up destroying the diving bell. So okay, everybody knows that it's there now. Shortly thereafter, the beast comes ashore and begins destroying New York. Uh, basically, just rampaging throughout the city side, smashing buildings and crashing cars, eating whoever it can get its jaws on. You know, typical monster stuff. So, uh, basically, military steps in, tries to stop it. All their weapons prove ineffective. However, the scientist from the beginning notes that there's a weird discrepancy with the creature, um, the creature's blood that's left behind. Apparently, they ended up wounding it, but they never really realized it due to, you know, all the various monster smashing activity, but... The monster has a susceptibility to a radioactive isotope that they realize if they can inject it into the creature, they can stop it. So um, I'm going to leave it for there. Um, even though it's, you know, you can figure out where it's going from that description. Um, you, you probably should still see the finale. But uh, as I said earlier, the film is basically just a, show, a, a showcase piece for Ray Harryhausen's effects, which... Um, uh, this guy is probably, I would say, the le- um, the legend in uh, movie making and stop motion animation. Um, I'm not going to go into detail on what stop motion is, but um, you know, if you don't know what it is, it's basically taking clay models of something, moving it one frame at a time, taking a picture of it, and then forwarding, you know, putting those pictures into a pr- processor, and then putting them at, you know, 24 frames a second, and it would create the illusion of movement. And that's basically what he did here. He created all of the special effects in the film. Uh, the creature, the matte, paint, the matte paintings, putting it into New York City skylines, creating all this destruction and all the, you know, the fun monster battles. Uh, it, basically, that's all him, and it's, you know, it's the highlight piece of the film. You don't really get a, a whole lot otherwise, in, you know, th- that would really you know, knock the film down. Uh, the human drama is not necessarily the greatest. It's basically 50s sci-fi stuff. Uh, essentially, the scientist is, you know, trying to convince everyone of what he saw. You know, at the very beginning of the film, he sees the creature come out of the ice. He sees, you know, the cre- you know, he sees it leave the area, but, you know... Oh, it's the howling wind. You fell in a crevice. Your friend died from being too close to an avalanche. You know, all this stuff going on. Basically, his, you know, account is, you know, not discredited, but not necessarily believed to the fullest extent. So he has to spend the rest of the film trying to, you know, get everybody on his side to say, you know, hey, the creature's out there. You know, there's something going on all of these boat disasters that are happening and nobody realizes that they're actually, you know, there's a pattern to them in that every single incident is leading from the Arctic Circle down to New York, which is where they're at. So, you know, he's the one that puts two and two together. He's the one that, you know, realizes that the the monster's out there and it's heading for New York. And he, you know, he does that by basically starting a romance with the female assistant to this paleontologist at a museum in New York. And if I say that, I say if it's a 1950s monster movie, you should realize what's going to happen there. They're basically going to be lovebirds the rest of the movie. And, you know, it it goes on from there. Um, Basically, uh, you know, there's not much to dislike here. Uh, The film is fun. It's fast-paced. There's, you know, a lot... you know, there's a lot to really like about it. Um, like I said, the special effects are top notch. The story is really simple. If you've seen tons of these giant monster movies, uh, you basically know exactly what's going to happen. But you know, 
it's not a detriment at all. Uh, it, the one area that I do think the film, um, if I could probably name a flaw, would be this one weird sequence where inside the uh, bubble, when they're going into uh, the, the trench to try to find the creature, inside the diving bell, there's this weird sequence where it cuts to this uh, shark and octopus that are being... Uh, Supposedly in the film, they're said to be photographed um, fighting on the ocean floor. But in reality, what happens is it's basically, you know, it's shot through the glass at a, you know, an aquarium. It's not, it's not filmed at the bottom of the ocean, and you can tell. But the main objective is the fact that in uh, the creature, if it's the, the creature in the film, which is a, uh, I haven't said this, but um, they call it a redosaurus. So R H E D O S A U R U S. It's a fake. It's a fictitious creature. It doesn't exist. But the Redosaurus is said to be about twenty-five to thirty feet tall and you know eighty to one hundred feet long. So it's a huge animal. You know, it's tall enough to stand up on the shores and reach the upper rungs of a lighthouse, which we see several, t- which we see in one of the most memorable sequences in the film, where it's standing on the shore and the creature is able to look up at the top of a lighthouse. So, you know, the thing's huge, but yet the shark and the octopus, the thing, the creatures, the the species that they use in the sequence is probably only maybe five, six feet long at best. So. The creature going for them just seems rather weird that they would choose to use those particular species that the creature wouldn't even really notice or go for. Um, But yeah, uh, it's really, you know, it's a nitpick. um, And that's probably, you know, an example of how good the film is. You know, like that's really the main flaw to the film. You could probably knock it for its, you know, stiffness, its stilted acting, you know, the 50s approach and aesthetic, but that's its charm. Uh, You're not going into this trying to watch a 90s or 2000s era creature feature. You're, you're, You're in the 50s, so that's basically what you have to look at this as. And, you know, that's the charm of the film. It's all about, you know, the aesthetic and the approach and all that good stuff, so... Uh, yeah, uh, this is definitely one to check out. Uh, you're not going to go wrong with this one. You know, it's barely 90 minutes. Um, it probably just touches even 80, if that. Um, I forgot to confirm the running time before this one, um, which is my my fault. Um, I forgot about that. But, uh, yeah, this is uh, one to look at. You're not going to go wrong with this one. So uh, definitely put it on your list and check it out. Uh, you know, if you want to check me out, um, I'm pretty easy to find online. I just go by my name everywhere. So, uh, yeah, I guess uh, that'll wrap it up for now. Uh, thank you again, Gary, for uh, letting me do this and uh, talk to you guys next time. Yes, that was uh, the lovely Don and Ellie, that, that man w- w- with uh, the tank tops. They call them Donnie tank tops with love, of course. Uh, lover of monster movies and... Um, we we thank him from the bottom of our hearts again for pimping our podcast. I, I can't say that enough because he does it every day for everybody. Um, so, yeah, thank you for the review and thank you for that, sir. So important for promotion. Love, love, love that Donnie rings. But, yeah, next up uh, on the next day of um, 31 Days of Howling Beach, which will be day seven, um, I'm going to take the reins of this one again just to spread out these lovely reviews from these people. And I'm doing the 1965 aptly titled Blood Beast from Outer Space. I'm sure it has other titles that we'll get into. You can find that film on YouTube if you want to watch along with us. But I'm surprised nobody picked that up from the title alone. It's got to be good, right, guys?